Uh, hey folks, uh, Jason Pye, welcome to the Lemur and Pie Happy Hour. That is a tentative name because Nathan and I could not think of anything better <laughs> in the 15 minutes we were we were talking before we actually hit record. Uh, so my cohort, Nathan Lemur. Hi guys, welcome to the pod that may never have any listeners, but let's just go with it. <laughs> it, it. It may never have any listeners, but it makes us it makes us feel happy. And that's all that really matters. So uh, Nathan, Nathan and I have been talking about doing this for God, how long? Years. Years. Yeah. And, and the pandemic has has allowed it to happen. So uh, here, 11 here months and 11 months in the pandemic. And we finally are doing what we set out to do at the beginning of the pandemic. I remember you know, right after CPAC and, and I had exposure, CPAC 2020, great year, never forget. Um, <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, COVID's here. I have to like go work from home forever. I should start a podcast with Jason Pye. <laughs> we talked about it off and on through the entire pandemic of 2020, we lead up to the election. And to be honest, Jason just didn't want to do it with me. That's a and lie. We just we we actually actually the, the truth is I finally got uh, podcast equipment as you can see this incredible <laughs> gift <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know I am on the board of of an organization and they sent me podcasting equipment to do podcasts which we have not done yet so I finally just kept it until they asked for it back and in the meantime I'm going to do the show which is great. The, the, the sad thing the indictment on the two of us is that. Uh... Uh, medical researchers and pharmaceutical companies actually produced a vaccine in a quicker period of time than it took Nathan and I <laughs> to actually start recording a podcast. So here we are. Uh, actually, let's talk about the vaccine for a second. So it's it's sure. February 16th. Um, what's, what, when are you getting the vaccine? Are you going to get the vaccine? I, well, first of all, yes, I'm going to get the vaccine, uh, which, is, which is funny because uh, ordinarily I have a and this is going to sound stupid. I have an aversion to needles. Go no, I, I get that. <laughs> go, yeah. go, go I, figure. I, I, oh. <laughs> I, wait, you have you who has like 12 tattoos. 14. 14 has an aversion to needles. Yeah, including one really big one on my leg. <laughs> so the, the one on my leg is massive. But um, yeah, I have, a, I have an aversion to needles. I don't like getting like at the doctor's office. I never like getting shots. So, uh, but yes, I will get vaccinated mainly because I, I, I keep everybody like the circ the COVID circle around me keeps getting tighter and tighter. Like most of the people I know have gotten COVID. Uh, right. But like my entire family got it. Like friends have got it. People I live with in DC, they got it. Uh, so it keeps getting tighter and tighter or closer or, or more and more or smaller and smaller. Uh, and I still haven't managed, I still haven't caught it and, but I want to get it because I want to be able to do things and all that stuff. And it just, yeah. Are you going to get it? Yes, absolutely. Um, I've actually signed up. Um, I was actually going to ask you about Georgia. So in Virginia, I'm in Alexandria for, for the four people who may listen to this podcast and not know where I live. Um, which basically means anyone who's not my mom who will actually listen to this. Um, so I signed up. Virginia is like slowly distributing it to, to older folks and okay. probably doing some equity program or whatever. But like I, as a 35 year old, healthy white male is clearly at the bottom of, of, of the food chain um, for COVID, not everything else. I'm at the top of the food chain for everything else. Is so I've been told, but, but um, on this, I'm at the bottom of the food chain. However, there's a caveat and I found it. So it says in the Virginia like guidelines that for pre-existing conditions, you can, you can get it. Right. And believe it or not, smoking is on that list. It, no, I'm not kidding. Like we all kind of joke about this, but smoking is on the list. And actually I, it makes sense. I mean, if you, if you, if you have like, you know, something that would, you know, impair your lungs or, or make yeah, you yeah, more yeah. likely to get, it, I get it. But it also says, and I don't smoke. I haven't smoked in like literally 14 years, but it does say that if you have ever smoked, and in college, as everyone in college did my freshman year, I used to like roll my owns and jarums like all the time. Were was were those really cigarettes though? <laughs> I don't know, man. Like, Ro like rolling your own. Yeah, we did the roll your owns. You know, no, they were no. It was it, it, it was tobacco. I, I I get what you're getting at. No, it was tobacco. <laughs> that I took to, you way too long. <laughs> yeah, way too long. No, I I roll. I do the roll your owns because I was hipster. And then in Michigan, it gets really cold quick. Went to school in Michigan. Shout out to Kelvin. Um, I, I, uh, it was like super cold. So I switched over to Jarums because that's what 18 year old kids do because they don't know what a real cigarette's like. Um, 
And then I snuck into a bar and, and got a pack of cools because they had the cool girls. Do you remember this back in the I day? The, the girls cool, would walk yeah. around with the cools and you thought you were so cool because like <laughs> you got a free pack of cigarettes. So like, I think I smoked like at least like three or four packs over the course of my life oh, God. before college. So I counted it. And so I signed up. <laughs> and I am registered to get it in like a month. I'm now, very excited about this. Now I got to see if Georgia does something like that because in Georgia, I was not slated until the next phase. I, I forget. I think mm -hmm. it's phase, I think it's phase B or phase two, whatever it is. Right. Uh, that's when it's opened up to general population to 18 to 64. Uh, so I think I think that's what it was. I looked like two months ago. I don't really remember at this point. Yeah. But, but no, I mean, I, I, I'm going to sign up. I'm going to go get it. Just a matter of of actually following through with it. But but I was a I'm a former smoker. Yeah, you're a real former smoker. Yeah, I was a real, I'm a real former smoker. I smoked like a pack a day for a while. So, uh, and, and then cut that out. I wasn't, I, I was not a smoker for that long. Right. I don't, I don't think, I think I, I think I started smoking regularly, uh, around the time I turned 31. Like, okay. Like, like half a pack a day. Started right. Out. And I think my peak for a couple of years was, uh, a half a pack to a pack a day. And then I stopped. Because I, I started having um, uh, panic attacks. Right. So, and I also gave up coffee, too. <laughs> I don't miss cigarettes as much as I miss coffee. You get, you gave up coffee? I gave up coffee. You clearly have no children. I do not have children. Yeah, because if you did, you would not be able to live off coffee. <laughs> I, I, I really, I, I say this, and I'm serious about this. I really miss coffee. It's so good. Like, I, I get it. I get it as black as my soul. Uh, yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. Yeah, no, no sugar, no, no cream. Black is my soul, and uh, I, God, I miss it so much. That was a really good segment for our first segment as a podcast. That was actually <laughs> kind of interesting. I, I, I want to learn more. I want to visit this, <laughs> I visit but I can't go into this now, or then we'll turn into a Joe Joe Rogan podcast. We got to so wait. We'll, we'll we'll get to this another point because well, this could be three hours. I, I got I got there was some news today. Yes, there was. Uh, there was some news today. So. Uh, apparently, the former president of the United States, uh, Donald Trump, uh, issued a scathing statement through his uh, political action committee, slamming uh, Mitch McConnell uh, for for comments McConnell made right after the uh, the uh, article of impeachment was dispensed with in the Senate, and they uh, and Trump was acquitted. Yes, that's, that's a very good uh, TLDR. Thank you, uh, Jason. Uh, uh, that, that's exactly what happened. But he he released a statement which is seven paragraphs long. I didn't. That's an op-ed. That's an op-ed. For him, <laughs> that's a really long statement. Like that's at least 500 words. That, that's a lot. We don't usually see it that way. And what, what's interesting is that he released a statement, seven, seven paragraphs, which again, to screen grab, you have to like release it in like two or three. Yeah, there, there are two pick screen grabs of it, which is unusual for, for probably the most pithy you know, uh, one liner uh, politician we've ever had ever in the United States. But he released this, this seven paragraph uh, uh, statement, which is basically an anti Mitch McConnell statement. And to be, you know, we, we, we do need to have a special episode about Mitch McConnell because he is a man who, when I came to DC, I loathed. Like I was supposed to loathe him. I came in the libertarian Tea Party wave, working as a staffer for Representative Justin Amash. May he live forever. Um, but, you know, I, I but over the course of years, I, I've learned that that Mitch McConnell isn't the evil bad guy. I yeah. was led to believe he's actually kind of a badass, like he's cocaine Mitch. He like he like he like confirms judges. He holds Democrats accountable. And like he he does things for the good of the party. He tries to keep his party together. He has a great whip count. He he you know, he, he does these things as, as a unit as best as possible. And so actually interesting, you know, conversation over the past couple of days has been the way that the party was kind of shifting towards actually ex many more members were shifting towards accepting an impeachment, potentially convicting the president um, after some shenanigans over the weekend where the Democrats voted for witnesses, then said, no, we don't actually want to do witnesses because heaven forbid we actually have real accountability and do a full process. We're just going to like do a quick vote and get a press release out, raise some money and move on, which then leaves a lot of unanswered questions and a lot of problems. But again, all this time, I, I've grown to appreciate Mitch McConnell. I don't know about you, but 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 is that's where I, I've become. Yeah, I would say I would say I would say I agree with that because um, 
because McConnell, I was like you starting out. Um, for those of you who don't know, I, I, for the past six and a half years, I worked at Freedom Works and am in my final two weeks of employment at Freedom Works and moving into a new role at the beginning of March um, at the Due Process Institute. But I was a lot like you in the sense that I, when I started at Freedom Works, Mitch McConnell was the big bad. Like he yes. was, he was the guy we all hated. We were, he's the guy we were all supposed to hate. But I have found, and yes, I have had my run-ins with his office, uh, including during the First Step Act, as as you as sure. you remember that that how that bill because we worked on criminal justice together when you were at our right. street, and um, but I, I'll say this, I I. I am very unhappy with the way like federal spend, spending has gone and how how DC continues to be run. But at the same time, I have been very, I have admired Mitch McConnell and the way he has, he has approached his time as Senate Majority Leader while Trump was in office. Obviously, he's now yeah. Majority Leader, but still, even now, I I appreciate. I mean, I I I appreciated his comments throughout the course ever since. Uh, Biden was was declared to be the victor of the presidential race right. the Saturday after the election. McConnell right. McConnell accepted it. He accepted it uh, when the Electoral College cast its votes in December, and he he has accepted it ever since. His statements since January sixth, I thought were on point. His statements about impeachment or about impeachment and about whether he would uh, the handling of the trial, I thought were on point. I agree with everything he said on Saturday. The only thing I disagreed with was his vote. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I'm of the mind Trump should have been convicted, but that's just me. So, and, and actually, that's a great conversation. I don't want to have that at the moment, but we could get into it a little bit. I mean, here's the here's where I'm at on, on that issue. Like, actually, I'm just going to jump right into it. <laughs> that's what podcasts do. You literally say, I'm not going to say it, and then I'm going to go way into it. Yeah, you're going to say it. So here's my take on, on that. Like, I think a vote for witnesses would have been very interesting for the American people. And regardless of whether you think he should have been convicted or not, I I think it would have settled a lot of questions and it would have enabled the public to get an idea of settling this issue once and for all. Look, we had a horrible incident on January 6th as, as guys who, who worked in grassroots advocacy and conservative world for a long time, we both, saw what happened and were, were, were saddened by that and disheartened by that because it was kind of like the worst demons coming out of, of, of grassroots. And that's frustrating. It's very, very um, problematic for us. Uh, uh, and so we saw that. And, and also at the same time, like kind of wrestled this past month, but the American people have as well. And a lot of conspiracy theories have come up. There's been like ideas like, oh, is Antifa that was leading it, you know, the president didn't have anything to do with it. Or, or questions about like, what was he doing for three hours while yeah. it was happening? Yeah. There's all these other questions. What was Mike Pence doing? What did they know? What was the coordination? What was the communication like? And I think that in a world where we do have QAnon theories and Russiagate theories and all these other conspiracy theories running around, I think witnesses in using the Senate, the world's greatest deliberative body to evaluate these questions in as close to a court as possible yeah. would have been helpful for everyone. It would have been boring. It would have been slow. So basically like Matt Iglesias, uh, a subsec. <laughs> I'm wait, waiting on the check, Maddie. But my point <laughs> is um, it would have been a slow, boring process, Matt. Thank you. But uh, it would have been important for the American public and it yeah. could have lasted a couple of days. It could have lasted a month or two. And I think that it would have been valuable and I think actually at the end of that day, if you already had six or seven Republicans voting for conviction, I think you and you have Mitch McConnell basically blasting the former president while not actually endorsing conviction. Like, I think you could have sm- swung him. I think you could have swung other people. And, I, and I'll be honest, like if the Democrats weren't going to open up witnesses, I, I wouldn't have voted for conviction either because it's just a farce at this point it's a press release over the weekend that that's me you can disagree that's fine that's oh. what a podcast is for but for <laughs> me by by you had a bipartisan vote for the first time on a procedural issue that did not go the way the senate majority leader uh, uh chuck schumer thought why not build off the opportunity to actually see this issue through also one more point the benefit of this as a conservative is it would have slowed down the Green New Deal. It would have slowed down the Democratic <laughs> agenda and it would have slowed down Biden's like effort to destroy America. Oh, also made us focus on near a tandem for a lot longer, which I love focus on near a tandem. So 
all that would have been great for me. It would have been a win, 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 win. So I was so pumped. But, but let me, let me, so I, I hear you. And, and I think, look, I think first and foremost, that this impeachment effort was hindered by the last one. Uh, because I think, I think that one was superfluous and had Democrats not, not tried to do it as you know, it wouldn't have, this one would have had a little bit more credibility or maybe even a lot more. Yeah. Credibility. Right. You know, and I think that's that's problem number one. And then problem number two, I think you're right about the witnesses. I do think, I mean, I think you're right about the witnesses in the sense that they should have called witnesses. Um, I think that there was enough, this one was, it, this is not like the last one. The last one, it was, it was a, a weird situation where it was basically a he said, she said between intelligence officials, what little transcript information we had. And then, um, and Democrats just not liking Trump. Right. But with this one, everybody knew it. Everybody saw it. It played out on national television. We know where the gaps in time were when Trump was not saying anything because it's all public. The man communicates via Twitter. We all know that. He did. Was that? He did communicate via Twitter. Yeah, he did. <laughs> he did communicate via Twitter. Yeah, he did communicate. Yeah, he did communicate via Twitter. But and we can we can if you want to discuss tech, we can definitely discuss that. But the, the thing the thing that bothers me so much, um, I, I don't, the thing that bothers me so much was the, the questions of constitutionality. Right. And, and, and I think Raskin, Jamie Raskin, the congressman from Maryland, who was the lead impeachment manager, probably had it right when he said that Republicans essentially did not vote for this. The biggest excuse for Republicans not voting for it was it was a, there was a, it was a technical issue mm -hmm. that this was somehow, the Republicans argued that it was unconstitutional uh, to remove, you can't remove a president who's not currently in office. Mm -hmm. You can't vote to convict a president who's not currently in office. And I, I mean, I've seen arguments on both sides. I tend to go with the ones who say that you can, uh, because you can convict him because he was president when the act occurred. Right. Uh, and plus you had the residual question of, of, um, of, you know, banning him from ever serving in office again. I think that's a, 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 a question that can obviously like, sort of argue the point, but like Ilya Soman, Eugene Volokh, uh, others who, other libertarian and conservative legal scholars who I read all said that it was possible. Um, and of course, but James Wallner, just in the, on the opposite mm -hmm. point of view, someone else who I, I greatly respect and admire, who works over R Street, he said, you can't. Um, so, I mean, I think there's a debate, but why not let the courts sort that out? Let the courts answer right. that question. Go ahead and cast the vote, vote your conscience, uh, and then let the court sort it out if there's a lawsuit. Uh, I think that would have been the best way to go. And I think it's I think it's kind of a uh, a weak argument to say you're you're voting you're voting not to convict someone based on that because the, we have Article Three for a reason, our, and we have judicial review for a reason, and the courts can settle that dispute. You know, I, I think I think that largely fits in with me. I, I, I just go back to this idea. I, I just I would have I wanted to. There were questions that I think should have been answered. And I think what's unfortunate is we're going to see a New York Times deep dive. We're going to see an Axios story like the Jonathan Swan piece from last week. Love you, Johnny, um, where it's like a, you know, behind the scenes of Trump's like last moments in office where you have all, you know, Susan Powell and Sidney Powell and all these people coming in and, you know, spending out like, like all these tell you what happened hours later, you know, uh, Jamie Herrera, Butler, uh, Bueller, Butler, Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. I think it was Bueller. She, she, she is a lovely United States representative. I'm, I'm a big fan. Uh, I've, always I've, never, have been. I've, I've never met her. I've never she, met she's her. very nice. Uh, uh, wonderful Congresswoman. Woman. And, and, you know, her statements, you know, they kind of made a big deal because her statements had come out and, and about like what she had heard or saw. Yeah. And again, the point is like, we're going to see a New York times deep dive. We're going to see a wall street journal deep dive. And the re reality is half the country is not going to listen to it yeah. because they're going to be like, well, this is liberal garbage. Or it's going to be unnamed sources, and we can never, ever listen to unnamed sources because it's against the former president. And I think that's why, for me, the, the witnesses part really bummed me out. Like, I really, I really wanted to get into it for a few weeks. Also, I wanted to delay the Democrats. But, like, you know, I, 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 I'll be honest. It, it was a two for one for me. And actually, let me tell you this. This strategy of, like, seeing the immediate policy implication, but also the, the, the ramifications it has on your enemy, it's something Mitch McConnell is a brilliant tactician at. 
like I think it's something that that we as libertarians never gave him credit for. Again, this is not a Mitch McConnell apology podcast, although that would be an amazing podcast Maybe. title. <laughs> the Mitch McConnell apology podcast would be great map. Um, but the, like the, the turtle always wins. Yeah, the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cocaine <laughs> Mitch. Uh, that's what Restless is for, and the and the comfortably smug and Josh Holmes people are for. But um, but my point is like like like. I, I, I see, he sees the bigger picture, right? Like he's yeah. not seeing the immediate, what the grassroots thinks or what, you know, a specific policy implication means he's seeing a much bigger picture. He's seeing the ramifications for that. And so that's, what's funny about this diatribe between him and, and, and the former president, this back and forth, Mitch McConnell gives this speech, president Trump doesn't like it. President Trump, former president Trump can't tweet about it. So he waits for a few days to write a statement which is seven paragraphs long. And I don't know if you saw, there's a lot of background now about what the original draft included. Like there were more ad hominem attacks and back and forth about what, what was he going to end up saying? The, the and, thing that, the thing that got me though, was he was like, we're, I'm, I, he was, I work, your MAGA is going to do primary challenges. And I'm sitting here and hold on a second. Let me read here. Mitch McConnell was just reelected to another yes. term <laughs> as a Senator from Kentucky. <laughs> Right. So like he would be next up for election hypothetically in 2026, which if Trump ran again in 2024, he like again it's it it just doesn't make any sense. The math does not sense. make any sense. Um, and the weird thing is, people in his state have had issues with him for years. For years, and he wins. He knows the game. Plus, let's be let's be honest here. I mean, you know this as well as I do. The electorate has a very short term memory. Yes, they do. It's going to be what have you done for me lately? When it's time to go to the vote, uh, th this is what I, I get, uh, and, and you you probably see this too. Uh, these push polls about like Josh Hawley. What do the people in Missouri think about Josh Hawley? Or like. For example, and I, and I got sent this by a bunch of our, our, our libertarian friends who really dislike Josh Hawley because of his, you know, stance on technology policy. Um, but not, like, not only because of his stance on technology. Well, I'm just going to focus on that one. The the 230 truthers out there who who will never hear anything about 230 that's not, you know, um, uh, 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 a puritanical belief in the in the 26 words that created the internet. Which, by the way, I think they might be right. I'm a 23rd, uh, 230 agnostic seeking i'm a seeker i'm a seeker friendly guy you know just trying to think things out but my point is they sent me all these polls about like what does missouri think about josh hawley or or uh or the united states and i saw like the polling was like oh he only has a 25 percent approval rating and, and they're like you see, in, in, in the national polls and i'm like mitt romney has a six percent approval rating like what are you trying to prove here? Like, I, like, 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 you know, like every other member of Congress has like a 20% or 30%. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, who cares? These numbers mean nothing in January of 2021. At, at, the, at the national level, the, the view, he, he's pushing this. It's, it's basically thoughtful, compassionate conservative. Like, it's right. compassionate conservative conservatism with intellect. Because I mean, I'm not saying Josh Hawley's not a smart guy. I think he is a smart guy. I think he knows what he's doing. Do it. I also don't think he believes any of the shit he says. With all that said, I don't think he does. But with all that said, um, I think he's pushing a, a very social, very socially conservative message mixed with basically moderate, you know, moderate fiscal views. And that was basically George W. Bush. It's it's right. his his is his has a much more uh, nationalistic. Uh, flavor to it than bush ever had bush was you know according to most of the national conservatives bush was a uh, uh was a globalist and 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 i see him i see him do it but i think he's he's got so much competition like tom cotton just today introducing a minimum wage increase with mitt romney yeah you know that's and cotton's cotton is very obviously moving to the center he mm -hmm. did that. He did that with his votes on January six. He was playing that. He was playing making right. making that gamble that voting voting for or uh, or not opposing any of the the electors right. and voting for the electors that were challenged would position him better with with the center. Now, right. Cotton still got other problems like the fact that he wants to bomb literally every country that's not the United States and maybe Canada. But it's it, you know it's going to be an interesting the the way watching things play out between the two of them is going to be very interesting. So I so I don't have this same I can't get into Holly's head and I've and I've learned that it's I'm not at the point where I could 
you know, suggest I can or not. I, I, I think he's a very fascinating political figure. Um, and, and I also think Tom Cotton has shown that he's a very interesting political figure as well. I actually want this debate in the party. Like, I really want this debate. I want national conservatives to be part of the conversation. I want populists to be part of the conversations. I want libertarians in there. I want strict uh, social conservatives. And my point is, like, if I believe in free speech and 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 concepts of of free expression and and questions about the future of governance and the right approach, I really want a vibrant debate. Yeah, and I mean, on the I, Democratic I, side, they're all the same. They they really all the same. Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema might might show different colors every once in a while. But in the Conservative Party, like I, I think I think the Republican Party should look like the Federalist Society, where you actually have like different views on intellectual property on tax policy, on on minimum wage, on the future of, of, of conservatism. What does that mean? I actually want these debates. And I say this only because um, I don't know that my team, the Liberty team, has done a really good job on our own. And I actually oh. get worried that if we continue down our track of our way or the highway, again, even if it's not the best policy outcomes for what I actually prefer, then like I, 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 I just don't think we're going to win. And I don't think we have anyone who's doing a good job of sharing that message. Hopefully those people who are sharing the message want to come on our podcast and explain it and how they can explain to all sorts of other people why they're doing better. But my, again, I actually like this debate. I think it's a fun debate. It's, it, can, it can be intellectually honest. However, I think to your point, there are certain people, I'm not naming names, who are not intellectually honest. And I don't actually know where their positions actually are. And I don't know, and I can't tell if the intellectual Trump idea is a ploy just to like set up a new organization or if they actually believe it. Because I could see a, a, an avenue for populism, not that I would support it, but that I think is interesting. And I think there are certain people who would want to hear that and see that out there, a conservative populism versus a liberal populism. But like, I, I just don't know... Um, I don't know who should be the guardians of that conversation. And so I want that to happen. So that, I, I, I don't know if that makes any sense to you. No, what, what, no it makes sense. I, th- I mean, and, and I agree with you. I agree with you that having, having the conversation is, is one that's probably very important to have. And we should have these debates because ultimately I think it'll make us stronger. Right. Uh, although I'm not a Republican. And <laughs> so there's that, but I mean, but I do believe in a, I do believe in two part. Uh, uh, I do believe the Republican party needs to get its shit sorted out yes. because you need You've got to have two competitive parties, and if you right. don't have, if you have, if you don't have two competitive parties, uh, one party rule has the, uh, has has historically not not worked out so well. Yeah, and so that that's my that's that's the. But as far as it goes, um, the debate's one that should be had. But the the dishonest players, there are so many of them, and and also, I yeah. agree. I also. Agree. The dishonest players who, who and this is from my view, the, the ones who are claiming this mantle of national, uh, of national conservatism, I think are the ones who um, are the ones who I think have the most to kind of explain, uh, or at least mm-hmm. at least try to um, uh, figure uh, figure out. Uh, the conversely, though, I think a lot of the traditional fiscal conservatives and libertarians who engage those national conservatives. Uh, are often um, obtuse mm-hmm. in, in a lot of different ways, at least from what I've seen. Uh, and and then I I don't know. And, and I, I inherently I don't think populism is a bad thing necessarily. I, I do because like you remember you remember the original Tea Party right uh, rallies. That's that was libertarian populism. Yeah, actually, that's actually really. By the way, I'm literally looking up all the articles from Peter Sudeman. Tim Carney, Ross Douthat, Jesse Walker, um, Con Carroll, by the way, shout out to my guy, Con, about libertarian populism. So we should, I, I think you are totally getting at something which is eight, 10 years old that people don't wrestle with. That yeah. there was a libertarian populist uprising. Yeah. I mean, in I, 2010, 2011. That's right. Libertarian populism was, was, was basically, it was, it was 2009, 2010, maybe 2011. And then the grifters came in and they basically took the Tea Party over and it became, it became a vehicle for every, every uh, anti everything or pro Second Amendment thing that you could possibly imagine. It became anti immigrant. It became, uh, it became pro social conservative. It became pro Second Amendment. The things that, because it was inherently a fiscally conservative, li- limited government uh, uh, 
brand of populism when it started out, but it became something else. It was basically bastardized. Uh, but I mean, but when it comes, when it all comes down to it, I mean, I think from the national conservative, based on the arguments I've seen, yeah. And this is where it gets into tech policy, right? The national conservatives I've seen uh, have been um, have been, a, I think, in, and to some degree, very dishonest when it comes to tech policy. Because I think I think the underpinning there is not so much that they um, that they believe in the First Amendment or they believe in free speech online. I think it's I think it's a convenient vehicle. It's 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 very reminiscent of you know FDR beating up on corporations back during the new back during the 30s in the midst of the Great Depression. Um, where he beat up on corporations constantly, didn't trust them. It's basically that sort of sentiment coming into modern day. And let's face it, I mean, tech companies, any big business is a convenient target. Pharma, you know, uh, you know, well, well, hedge funds, you name yeah, it. Yeah, right. You know, they're all convenient targets. Right. And I think it's, and I think there's, there, they will, if they will low key, some of them will low key admit that they don't think these companies should exist. Not that they don't like how conservatives are being treated online. They just don't think the companies should exist, that they somehow made American society or at least uh, society worse. And I do think that the, there, I do think there's a point, there is some, something of a point there. I do agree that, um, I do agree, like the internet has been this wonderful tool that we've had since for, you know, that the has since we all got connected in the late night, late nineties and early two thousands, and you know, so on, that has brought us the entire world within the the tip of our hands. Right. Where yeah. I can, you know, I can go and converse on Twitter or Facebook with someone who who lives in Afghanistan. Remember, and 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 uh, when the Osama bin Laden raid happened back in two thousand eleven, there were there was a guy actually live tweeting what was happening um, at the time. Um, but at the same time, that those the internet's also brought us, taken, made us further apart. But the problem isn't the vehicle. The problem is yeah. us. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're the problem. We right. we treat each other like shit. Right. You know, and that's and that's ultimately that's the problem by and large. Now, the broader arguments about censorship of conservatives online, yeah, does, does that some does that exist? I think it does to some degree. Do I think it's as bad as people make it out to be? Absolutely not. Um, because I mean, was it Prager? You just crossed what a billion YouTube views. Like that doesn't sound like censorship to me. No, I, and, 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 and building off of that. And, and if my, my perspective on this kind of boils down to, to the following, which is that I think that there's real hypocrisy in the conversations about, you know, freedom and open internet by certain players who, who then <laughs> go act against those same principles that they espouse. And I don't know that regulatory overreach is the right way to address those concerns. And that's kind of where I'm at. But that said, I also think there should be healthy skepticism in conversation. And so I actually do like the idea of conversations about rethinking some of our traditional conservative ideas, whether it's on tech or certain aspects of industry or certain aspects of free of um of, of, you know, issues around tax law or, or, or uh, uh, other issues. I think that's all great. I actually think like the Mitt Romney proposal, which I would like to get into at another time, is interesting. And it's like fascinating for us as conservatives to think about what the approach to paternity leave should be or family tax credits or all that stuff. I think that's like healthy. But I also am concerned by the people who are generally pushing it are the people who I think if the winds were blowing a different direction, wouldn't even thought twice about this. And I think that's actually the, the thing that frustrates me the most is that like with Tom Cotton, he wants to spy on everyone. That's like part of his belief of national security. <laughs> right. I know that some of the people who are, you know, um, talking about, you know, breaking up big tech, if it was popular to ride Uber right now among conservatives, they'd be riding Uber. They'd be tweeting. They'd be using Facebook. And, and so for them to, you know, put their finger in the wind and say, like, which is directing, that's the part that I have a problem with. If yeah. you want to be a populist, if you really want to rethink the party, then you got to stake some claims that are not popular right now, yeah. because libertarians have been doing that for a long time. And yeah. some of our issues are actually finally popular now. Yeah. Medical, I mean, ma marijuana legalization, criminal justice reform, surveillance reform, limited approach to like foreign wars. This yeah. is like an insane proposition. 
dear friends in the populist movement, if you want to be taken seriously in my book, take, stake out those claims ahead of time instead of following on the coattails of a political leader, because that's not real populism. And the other thing I would also add to that is one of the arguments I've seen from the national conservatives in, in, in these, these sort of right-wing populists is that we've been in an era of economic libertarianism. And and I <laughs> right that that's one of the things right. that, that's one of the things that I'm I'm looking like today I was sitting I'm writing a memo and one of my the final things I do before I leave Freedom Works is writing a memo for my boss <laughs> on uh, <laughs> on the pre COVID economy and yeah. I was I was going through the Budget Control Act and like the spending increases that happen every year right. after the Budget Control Act became law. And it's like eight hundred and three billion dollars of spending. And this is discretionary spending. This right. isn't. This isn't mandatory spending. But I wanna. I want to show these people the the budget that like the CBO estimates and say, show me where the economic liberty. You show me. Here are the outlays for the federal government. They go like this, or I guess like this, depending on what. Yeah. Side, how no, you're good. Side, I, I got it. Um, Show me where the economic libertarianism, right. the libertarian uh, economics are, because what I see, or or if you think there's been austerity, show right. it to me because I don't see it. Yes, there have been. Uh, yes, we had the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed back in, 20, in to, the end of 2017. And yeah, I mean, I think that that made people overall better off. And certainly the 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 wealthy's uh, share of the income tax burden has actually gone up, not down, at least according to the I to IRS data. So show me where the economic liberalism is. Show I want yeah. I need you to show me because it does not like there is we've had yes we've had some tax cuts, but really all we did was we didn't go back to the Reagan rates of the 1980s. We're right. we're we're at the top income tax the t the highest uh, statutory income tax bracket is 37 percent. Yeah. It's, it's not 28% or 32% like it was in the Reagan era. No, I think I think that's exactly right. And and I and I will say in in the in the national conservative realm, I don't even again all these terms I'm are still being defined in some ways. But like there are some organizations that have come out that are relatively new. I'm going to give a shout out to one. I don't always agree with them, but like I I actually find the American Compass people interesting because they're bringing together people on the left and the right to talk about rethinking policy. And actually like I think that's like valuable to bring people together from other sides of the issue to rethink things. Now, again, I am on the same page on with them on everything. No, not at all. But then there are other people not naming names who like, I'm just kind of like, guys, is this, is this a ploy? Cause you think you're going to get some new grassroots support? Like when, like, like if, if you're rethinking the idea of free trade and you're going to adopt fair trade, which by the way, was popular among coffee shops in 2008 when we had fair trade coffee, fair trade coffee, <laughs> like if you think that's popular like you need to like you need to think about the ramifications of what you're saying because it's going to set you and your organization and the party that you don't are a member of although i am um in a direction that could put them in, in, a, in a problematic space and i think that like these guys people there, there's a way of being careful about it and there's a way of not being i just I, I when it comes to like an issue like trade i don't think they understand the ramifications of right the, like the a sort of um uh I guess an overtly nationalistic uh, trade policy. We saw that in Smoot Hawley. It didn't work out so well back in in 1930. And the, we were that's the thing people don't remember. It's like we were in 1929. You had the stock market crash. The economy was actually on its way to recovering. And but oh god, Mike Lee just joined Clubhouse. Are you serious? I'm saying I just got I just got a notification. Oh, that's exciting. I, I actually almost texted him a uh, Clubhouse invite today. And I was like, ah, because I got three more invites today. I was like, I should Ooh. send you one. Uh, uh, the, somebody, the, just, the Justin Amash Mike Lee Clubhouse is going to be unreal. That's going to be lit. I, I, <laughs> we should host it. We should host it, yeah. That would uh, actually be really cool. That would be a lot of fun. So we, we um, where was I going with this? Sorry, I didn't mean to take you <laughs> off. Mike <laughs> Lee just threw us off. Mike Breaking Lee, news, everyone. Mike Lee just joined Clubhouse. Um, no, so... Um, I, I really forgot. Oh, the trade policy. So uh, it's the, we in 1929 the, the the economy was like on the road to recovery from the stock market crash. Right. And then in 1930, uh, Congress passes the Smoot Hawley Tariff Act. Hoover, Herbert Hoover signs it into law. And what happens next? The economy economy goes into a tailspin, and suddenly GDP drops dramatically. You have unemployment uh, 
I think by 1932, down around 23, 24%. And, and that's, that's, uh, I mean, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but we've seen the ramifications of Trump's trade policy, which was about a quarter of a percent drop in GDP. We saw about 130,000 jobs lost as a result of it. And, right. um, you know, that's, that's not a good, I, that's not, a, that's not a good thing. And I remember I was told trade wars are, are good and easy to win. And that doesn't seem to be the case. And I think, um, I think if you want to, if you want to hurt the American public, you do it. If you want to hurt the people you're trying to help, you do it through a, a, right. a, a very, um, uh, you know, nationalistic trade policy, a very protectionist trade policy that will ultimately, like, if you enjoy paying $5 for that widget at Walmart, rather than $10, you like free trade, whether you realize it or not, you like free trade. And some people may be willing to pay a little bit more for those widgets, but are you willing to pay $2, $3, $4, $5 more? The biggest contribution libertarians have ever had in Washington, DC is introducing the concept of studying not just what is seen, but what is unseen. And I think that Bastiat, Friedrich Bastiat uh, 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 principle is so true. It's actually, I think, the greatest contribution libertarians have ever had into political discourse, because I think they're the only group of people who think about the unintended consequences, think about what's unseen. You see the sticker price, but you don't see what's behind it. And that's actually, I think, also our burden as libertarians to explain that through everything yeah. that we do. The problem is we're not always good at telling that story and explaining it in clever ways um, and in helpful ways. And I think that's actually the one of the bigger problems why these other parts of the conservative libertarian fusionism has grown uh, because we haven't done a, great, a good enough job explaining the unintended consequences part, whether it's on intellectual property, whether it's on trade, whether it's on um, tech policy, whether it's on small businesses, whether it's on tax policy, all those issues. The, the thing that we, we, we are the course in the Greek tragedy that sits in the court corner saying, if you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. Yeah. But we haven't done a good enough job of explaining ourselves at various points. And I think that's something that we need to get better at. No, I agree with you. Liberty, like I, I, I've said this before and I'll continue to say it. Uh, we are the best. We, we are, we know what's, we know the economic ideas that work the best for the econ, uh, for, for the country as a whole, but we do a shit job of explaining it. Right. We are the worst communicators alive of libertarians. Yeah. Yeah. We are the worst communicators. Like, cause it's, it's, <laughs> it's, we have got, we have got to get so much better at that. But I, because I know, I know we're probably going to be running short on time here soon. And I do want to get to the statement, by the way. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I was, I was going to, I was, I was, I was going to change topics completely. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll so get to the statement later. We, we were talking, we were talking, uh, this was my, this was going to be my segue. It was something you said earlier. There are so many different labels and it made me think of um, uh, how many, like, yeah, there's, there's, there's national conservative, there's libertarian. I'm seeing neoliberal out there right. a lot these days. I myself, classical liberal libertarian. And it made me think of like, you know, at some point in time, someone's going to be, because I think libertarian is be losing its its appeal, like the, as a general yes. term to describe to describe what you believe. And I'm seeing a lot more people, including myself, use the term classical liberal. Right. And it reminds me, it reminds me, Nathan, of of the the late 90s and early 2000s when e emo bands did not like to be called emo bands and they preferred post punk and post hardcore. <laughs> You know, it's, I'm glad you're bringing that up. By the way, that's a great transition. Um, it is interesting how uh, politics can really learn a lot from music and music industry specifically, yeah. as well as like sports industry. Because when you think about these branding efforts and you think about kind of the issues that are underlying them, you're completely right. Like you don't want to be seen as emo. You want to see as like post-punk. You want to be seen as like... Um, uh, new era of some sort, and, well, and I think that's exactly right. One band that has 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 threaded that needle perfectly throughout the course of their careers uh, is Jimmy Eat World. Yes, Jimmy great Eat one. World, Jimmy Eat World. They put out uh, Static Prevails, and then they put out Clarity, which are two of the most defining emo records of the 1990s. Like, and they were in that. They were like they toured with the Get Up Kids. They toured with Break. Yeah. They toured with all these different bands, or at least played with them. They knew them. Uh, and, and they managed, but Jimmy, I remember Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Atkins, Jim Atkins, the singer of Jimmy at world gave an interview to guitar world back in, I don't know, 
I was a senior in high school when I read this thing. And I actually wrote a whole blog post about this over at my personal website. And um, he's like, sure, I'm sure a record label would love us, love it if we went out and called ourselves an emo band, but we would like to do this as a career. <laughs> You're right. It, it, it's funny, like, like, and actually going back to your original point about libertarians not actually being the center of the world in D.C., you didn't want to actually call yourself a libertarian because you actually want to have a job um, in, in D.C. So so it's the same point. It's the same throughput. Like, sure, you could have called yourself libertarian in high school, but then you wouldn't have got the job. Um, you did, but most people wouldn't have. Um, that, it's, because, you know, it's because I have a great personality. Nathan. Can, can I ask you, since we talk, we're, we're transitioning to music. This is this is what you get out of the uh, 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 lemur pie happy hour. Um Music. I want to talk quickly about music. Uh, Super Bowl, real quick. I want to go back to that. It's a okay. cultural moment. Let's talk about it. What was your take on this halftime show, uh, and why was it the most amazing halftime show ever? I, you know, I watched it, but I, I remember watching it and being like, "This is weird." Like, um, I don't really like halftime Super Bowl halftime shows because nine times out of ten, they're not actually playing the instrument or singing. Like, yeah. I. It, it, it just kind of bothers me so it just takes all the fun out of it like i i i'm a big fan of going to see live shows and, and going to mm -hmm. see live and going to see live music i'm really really looking forward to the post-covid days when i can do that again the last yes. the last saw i shot this last show i saw was february this time last year i saw thrice play in atlanta uh it was on their their 15th anniversary tour for their record called visu and uh, this is a thrice shirt by the way there you go um, but yeah i mean i miss live music but uh that's what i that's what i get the most out of like when i'm watching a show uh like on sunday night we watched the get up kids play the the, the one of their classic records something to write home about from front to back and it just wasn't the same to me so mm. it, they were really playing they were really singing because i could hear their screw-ups um but like it, i guess that's what it comes down to nathan like uh if you don't screw up during your performance i don't think it's real Mm. if you're mm. not if you're not flat or if you're not sharp or if you don't hit if you don't play the wrong chord at some point in time i don't think it's real so yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, I it's it's all for me it's 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 all pomp and circumstance and there's not a lot of substance there so for i actually got in a fight with my brother about the band and the concert because he was talking the entire time and doing what you normal do like doing what contrarians do during a concert of that performance was like you know pointing out all the flaws and or how it's like not you know the best music or whatever and i have grown an appreciation for pop music in general and particularly r b and specifically actually anything that has any connection with soul um uh funk sound in any way shape or form and so i was actually kind of annoyed at him went back and forth we worked it out it's fine but like what was interesting about it was i liked the fact that it was a guy i mean the song you know can't feel my face is about cocaine addiction and like how many times in the Super Bowl have you had a cocaine addiction song ever? You know, I like the fact that it's a guy who any, anytime the Rolling Stones have played. Yeah, but I mean, come on. Like, it's, it's not the same thing. There is something about uh, he has a darker edge to him that's very emo that is like there that's very present. And for me, I was like, I really hope this is a gateway for musicians that you would never associate with this type of performance. I don't know that's ever going to happen. But, you know, I was reading like a bunch of blogs afterwards and a lot of people were saying on Pitchfork were saying like, the, how the hell did this guy get to perform? This is not the type of music you see here. Could this be a gateway? Probably not. But I hope it's a gateway for new style music, new types of people who are into the realm. You know, look, I actually think like the two best performances before him and I don't think he was the best performance, but the two performances I like the best were Bruno Mars playing a drum solo for like 10 minutes, which was sick because I had no idea Bruno Mars could actually play drums and he's actually pretty decent. Yeah. And Prince, like those are the two performances that stick out to me in my lifetime. And so, and Janice and, 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 you know, Jan Jackson, God bless her. Um, <laughs> but, you know, before that, like those are the two performances that stick out to me. And so for me, I'm like, if this is some sign that pop music or, you know, what we see is like acceptable for like, great uh, big crowd performances is moving in a direction that's a little bit emotional, a little bit darker, 
a little more interesting, a little bit like behind the scenes, underneath the skin. I'm very much interested in that. Yeah. And so that, and also to be honest, like he's basically doing an ode to Michael Jackson, like the entire time. I think that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and so I, I liked that, but again, uh, I, I wanted your take cause you, you yeah. are, you are more, um, honest, uh, uh, music truther than I am. Oh, well, no, I mean, I think, I think just my, my whole thing about music. I mean, as I, I mentioned those other things is, you know, wanting, wanting to hear screw ups, wanting to, yeah. wanting to see it played live, uh, wanting to, I don't know, it's pop music, uh, by and large has never really done it for me. Like, it's not, it's not something it's maybe when I was like 12. Yeah, sure. But like, by the time I was 12, I started transitioning more into rock music and, and, um, you know, probably more soft rock and stuff that was played on the right. lo local radio. But uh, I didn't start getting into what like alternative music until I was like 13, 14. I really started getting into punk when I was 14. Uh, and at the time I was w working at a Chick-fil-A and they're like, have you ever heard of this band called MXPX? And I was like, actually, <laughs> actually, no, I haven't, but I would love to, I would love to hear them. And, and, and at that point forward, I was pretty much hooked on, on punk rock, but, but, and I, to this day, I have this one playlist that I constantly listen to, and and it's nothing but punk and hardcore. There's a few random not punk and hardcore songs mixed in, but you know, music for me, it's just I've never really been able to get uh, too much into pop, and definitely, ne definitely not into R and B. Uh, I do have an oldies. Uh, when I was a kid, my parents brought me up a little bit on on oldies. So I do, I do listen every now and then I'll listen to some oldies uh, every now and then I'll listen to like Robert Johnson. I don't know if you're familiar. With oh that. yeah. Oh, Skip um, James is my guy, man. That's some good stuff back yeah, there. Yeah. I mean, like Robert Johnson was this, this guitar player who <clears throat> I think he was 27 when he died and he, he, he couldn't play guitar worth a lick. And then he went somewhere for like a year and came back and could play the guitar better than anybody else around in, in his area in Mississippi and the the, the the urban the legend is that he sold his soul to the devil at the crossroads and the guy could play could play an amazing guitar had an amazing voice uh he was one of eric clapton's influences right. and and that i do occasionally i will occasionally listen to something like that but like uh but in every now like i found myself the other day uh well the other day like a month ago learning how to play jessica on the guitar by, mm. the, by the almond yeah, yeah yeah and i've been i've been i I own a bunch of guitar on my other side of my house here. I have a whole mu a room that is dedicated to uh, music and it's got all my guitars in there. It's got a, the drum sets in the closet. I got my guitar amps in there and all that stuff. And one of these days, maybe I'll record the podcast in there, but um, <laughs> uh, got to make sure the Wi-Fi reaches across the other end of the yes. house. But, but no, it's it, it, music is music is very important to me. I enjoy music. I enjoy most types of music, but there, there are certain types of music I'm just not able to get into and pop pop and, and, uh, uh, to a lesser degree, well, pop, rap, uh, and um, country are just three styles of music I've never really been able to get into. The pop and rock, pop, pop and R and B, changed for two reasons. One was uh, uh, this is the religion talk. I started attending a traditionally black church in D.C. and they play soul funk music, and oh, so cool. that that for me was cool to see a whole new sound. You know, when you break into Bill Withers' Lovely Day for no reason that I can understand, except for the fact that it's an amazing song and truly is a good worship song um, about just a lovely day. Um, you know, whether it's Otis Redding or others, like there, it interests me in a whole new sound and a whole new like beat, a whole new approach to, to hearing it. And that opened up doors to, to other, you know, R&B artists and soul funk that I just really get into. And I get it. I, I can see the roots to the blues and other things and how that connects to jazz and other parts of American oh, music yeah. that we like. But I would never listen to it otherwise until I started watching it live, getting that appreciation, just appreciating that. But um, pop, to be honest, pop RB, like like actual rap, I just kind of do it because like I do a lot of cycling now, and it's like great rhythmic for like what I'm doing. So I, I pick songs like, oh, this is the right beat. There are certain like white stripes songs that fit it too. There's also like certain songs that are like R and B that you just you know listen to to Meek Mill. Tell me, like, to get up this hill, I will get up that hill. Um, <laughs> and again, I have daughters now, so we listen to a lot of Taylor and all this other stuff. So I've I've been all that world. But um, again, like my my really I, I, at stake, just a, a real hipster, you know, recovering bohemian who would rather just listen like freaking Sufjan Stevens um and like some My Morning Jacket on right. any given. Well, I was day. gonna I was gonna ask you since we're on the topic of music, what what give me three bands or records you're currently listening to. Ooh, what I'm currently listening to, you know, I'm actually going to pull up the Spotify right now. You know, actually, this entire year, I have been dedicated to Justin, um, Justin Towns Earl, um, who passed away uh, this year. 
Um, and I, I think a lot of his music actually is really resonating with kind of the current era uh, that we're living in. He's kind of probably the most folksy that I'll get into. The other one that I give credit to is St. Paul and the Broken Bones. Do you listen to them at all? I don't listen to them, but I'm from very familiar with them. It's a really good sound. And it's like a really good soul sound that I, I just get into immensely. And then let's go with the last one. Um, gosh, I'm now like literally going through like a number of them. All right. Just because of true blue, man, Josh Ritter is my guy. I think, I think there is very few musicians that know how to like connect with suburban dads like Josh Ritter. If you are a suburban dad with three kids, in Alexandria, Virginia, you're listening to Josh Ritter in your Honda Civic. That's what you do. <laughs> I think. What about I, you? I think for me, I think for me, uh, so Jimmy Eat World's Clarity, uh, and that's just one because I because I've watched them when I on Friday I watched them play it from front to back. It was really good. So I've I've been I've been listening to that a little bit. I actually went in my uh, music room and relearned how to play some of the songs the other day. Um, and then so uh, this one's gonna be stupid, but ACDC's Black and but Back in oh, Black. Hell yeah! Yes. That's that's one I I found myself uh, both learning how to play certain songs and then just also listening to because uh, I thought um, I thought that uh, that record was like well it's one it was career defining it was defining it was the first one after uh, the death of Bon Scott uh, so it, it's just it's just an amazing record it's got some great riffs on it uh, the last one oh man I would say um, I'm gonna say Living Sacrifice is the hammering process which is a metal band. So uh, it's oddly enough, Christian metal band. So look at you, man, finding the Lord. I, I look yeah. forward to you, you yeah. coming back on this podcast. Um, all right, look, we, we are getting close to an hour, I think. And like, this is the first time we've done this. And we could like, you know, take off the recording and then say what we really think about Nicole Hannah-Jones and Taylor Lorenz, but we won't on the podcast. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I, I look, tomorrow, Phillies, uh, catchers and pitchers are reporting. That's right. That's right. Baseball, um, baseball season can we, can, can we do a quick roundup for, for the few fans that have the same interest in politics, culture, um, sports, and music uh, Absolutely. as us? Absolutely. For, I want to ask you, who, who is the team to beat in the National League? Whew, man. Uh, There's one answer. I, I'm going to say the Philadelphia Phillies. No, the Dodgers. No, nah, I'm going to say the Phillies. Okay, why? This is great. I like this. This is not what I expected. No, nah, I'm kidding. It's the Dodgers. Okay. I was... <laughs> <laughs> you really got me going for like 15 seconds no, it's, it's really it's, this is no, great no you're high it's the dodgers it's the dodgers yes <laughs> yeah. it, it is the dodgers um don't let it ever be said that i don't have a good poker face no that legit that was solid um uh and then on the american league oh man um god i haven't really thought of the al at all me either. uh i i i'm gonna go with the god dude i don't really know if i I don't really know if I have a good answer there. I don't. Uh, I don't I guess, know either. I don't really. I don't really follow the the American League as much as I follow the National League because I'm an Atlanta Braves fan. Right. Go Braves. Right. Uh, and I actually bought this a last on Friday last week at at Truist Park. This is what's on sale for ten dollars. This is a Braves hat. He's looking it's a, at. It's, it's an a, old school Braves hat. No, this is this is a, just a, an alternate Braves hat. It's I like it. Black and gray, and it's but That's it's nice. Fitted. It, it's fitted. And it was ten dollars. Look at that. Um. So, but uh, I got. I'm gonna go. I'm going to say the Rays, although I think I know the Rays made some trades. Uh, yeah. But because I know they went to the World Series last year, but I don't really know who else to pick. Um, I, I don't I don't really know. I don't have a good answer here. Yankees? Yankees. I'll just go with the Yankees. Yeah, I think it's the Yankees, I, I yeah. think. But I don't I don't I don't necessarily know. It's a good question. Going back to that, we are National League guys. You're an Atlanta Braves fan. I'm a diehard Phillies fan. We're um, NL East fans. We are we are NL East fans. To be honest, everything outside the NL East, I don't really care about. Like I, I, I and actually, this is how I am with all sports. I watch my team. I don't necessarily watch football for the sake yeah. of watching football. I watch the Eagles. I don't watch basketball for the sake of watching basketball. I watch the Sixers. Same with the Phillies. I watch every Phillies game. So we're in like a, probably the most competitive division in the National League. Yeah, at least. Yeah. And I thought the Braves looked like they would be very good, but people are the baseball reference came out with their picks. You guys were probably like, third. Yeah. It, the Mets, which I don't buy. I, I will not buy the Mets actually being good until they're actually good. Well, I mean, I could say the same thing about the Phillies. Cause like how many years have I seen the, right. the Mets and Phillies pick to finish higher than the Braves and, and the Braves come out ahead of one or both of them. Uh, I, you know, I, there, there are too many times of that I can count, but I'll say this much. Um, I think the Braves, 
the Braves did themselves a lot of good locking up Marcelo Zuna, yeah. uh, but uh, we still have a hole at third base. Uh, we still uh, we still have a hole in right field, um, and uh, you know we don't. I mean, yeah, we got a decent catcher, but like uh, Chris, uh, what's uh, Darno? Darno, Ar- yeah, that's his name. Um, and but like starting rotation is going to be a concern for us. Bullpen actually came through last year, but right, you know, we're losing we're losing Mark Melanson, so I really don't know what to expect this year. I mean, I think I think we'll definitely finish in the top, you know, top three. But the question is the order. Uh, yeah. It- I'm with you. I I feel like my team could go 81, 81 or like 86 wins. Like it's somewhere in there. I don't know which one. I don't think we're going to be in first place. I think we could sneak into the playoffs, but like, yeah. it really depends in that order of do the Mets really show up? Do the Phillies improve on last year? Do the Braves um, continue what they've done the past few years? And then what do you do with the nationals? Because yeah. they had a down year. I hate the nationals. We both hate the nationals. I think that's very safe to say they're a trash organization in a trash city with not real fans. To be honest, I actually think it was hilarious that the only team that put up their banner with no fans was the nationals because that's the way the nationals are. Um, yeah, everybody's everybody in DC is a nationals fan, but because they, that's the closest ballpark to them, they're all fans of somebody else. Yes. You're, you're another fan. And then this, I, I, it makes no sense to me. So so I, I don't buy in the Nationals thing. Soto's a great player or whatever. Scherzer's over the hill. That's my take on them. Um, also, they're a trash organization. Did I tell you that? Um, <laughs> Citizens Bank Park South forever. Um, I, I can say I can say it's a nice ballpark. I've actually been there, although I don't remember much when we left. It's 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 fine. We went to the game together. No, the, I'm talking about the Nationals Park. Oh, oh National. Oh, I'm talking about I'm talking about Citizens Bank. Oh, oh, that's a beautiful bar park. Beautiful One of the best ballpark. ballparks in America. Best experiences ever. You know why? It's my backyard. <laughs> well, I don't remember it either. We 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 drank a lot. We drank a, we drank a lot that night when we were when we realized that the tickets the tickets were all you can drink. We were just like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, they didn't mention that part. Love that experience, but um. I think we should revisit where we are going into, you know, next time we chat, because I, I, I would like to see us kind of, you know, go through this season, just given our updates on kind of where we are. I, no, I, 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 I think this is a good idea. I, I, I agree. But, but Nathan, you know what, man, we're, out, up, of t- man? we're out of time for today, man. Sounds so good. Uh, guys, if you enjoyed it, please, uh, please let us know. Uh, I'm going to post this on my Facebook. I presumably, and I'll probably put it up on YouTube too, just to see, just to see how it goes. Uh, I guess stay- rate, subscribe, check like, it out, like, share. And so I think we like, share, retweet, subscribe. retweet, like, share, subscribe. Uh, and you know, right. Sit, swipe text us, text us if you like it. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that's all the time we have for today. So y'all have a good one. We'll talk to you next week. Hopefully. Hopefully Take care, guys. Week. Peace out. Bye.